I am so excited to share a message with you that I have worked on and revisited numerous times throughout the COVID season. And every time I revisit this message, the Lord speaks to me from the passage afresh. So I'm so excited to share with you from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20 this morning as we listen to what God might be trying to say to us. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 20. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in a matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm trying to be a frequent blood donor. And people often ask me if I have a fear of needles. I don't. The thing that bothers me is actually the anticipation before the needle. It's those moments, those milliseconds before the poke. I wince more at the pain to come than the pain itself. But here's the thing. In the moments before the needle pricks your skin, you're supposed to make a fist and tense up so that a, a blood vessel pops. Yet, it's really important that you relax your muscles before the needle goes in. If you're holding tension, giving up your blood is going to hurt more. But if you relax and let go, it won't be nearly as bad. The Apostle Paul had it all. He was a true Renaissance man, if one could exist before the Renaissance. He would walk the streets of Rome or Jerusalem dressed in pomp, like a young executive strolling down king or young in his tailor-fit suit. Young Jewish men wanted to be like Paul. If he was alive today, Fanatic followers would flock to his Instagram or Twitter feed. They would like pictures of him hanging out with the high priest and his social activist tweets railing against those wacky Christians. Paul had it all. He admits it himself. In his letter to the ancient Philippian church leaders, in a passage just before the one we read, Imagine Paul writing out this email addressed to the First Fellowship Bible Christian Church of Philippi, where he says to the Philippians, I've got good reason to trust in the flesh. If anyone else thinks they have reason to trust in the flesh, I've got more. 
circumcised, check on the eighth day. Race, Israelite, check. Tribe, I'm from Benjamin, check. Descent, I'm a Hebrew through and through, check. Torah observance, a Pharisee. Zealous, I persecuted the church. Status under the law, blameless. Check, check, check. In checklist fashion, Paul rhymes off his social, political, and religious capital like he's penning an early century dating profile. Paul had it all. Until he didn't. It happens quicker than a celebrity tossed aside in cancel culture. Paul fell from glory. More like Paul fell into glory, but we'll get into that later. But here's Paul, this religious executive, type A, high status, ultra-religious boy, encountering Jesus Christ. And his life is never the same afterwards. Paul lost it all. And by lost it all, I mean he lost it all. Like a country song, his wife left, his dog died, and his tractor broke, except it was more like his elite crew ostracized him, his religious system spewed him out, and his fame and status crumbled to the ground. Paul goes from being one of the most loved and veneered men in Israel to one of the most hated and despised. So Paul now lives out most of the rest of his life as a nomad, traveling from city to city, caring for the sick and marginalized, encouraging and pastoring underground churches. And Paul is poor. He is broke. And his job is thankless. Some churches betray him, slam the door in his face for speaking truth. Townspeople pick up stones and play a deadly game of dodgeball. And finally, unsure of what to do with this enigma of a man, the Roman government captures Paul and they move him into an affordable bachelor pad that looks something like this. Minus the altar, which is clearly a later addition from Ikea. This is Paul's office space where he types out this ancient day email to the Philippian church. He writes these words to the church. I have learned to be content with what I have. I know how to do without. I know how to cope with plenty. In every possible situation, I've learned the hidden secret of being full and hungry. Whether I have plenty or I go without, the secret is this. I have strength for everything in the one who gives me power. I have strength in the one who gives me power. How could Paul possibly say that? I mean, come on, Paul, with everything you've been through, everything you're going through, you're telling me that you have learned to be content no matter what. Because if Paul's anything like you or I, there are moments when his old synagogue buddies cross the other side of the street and he questions if he's even loved or dignified. If Paul's anything like me, anything like you, when he sees his followers plunge in the smear campaigns and the headlines, his heart sinks. When his family shuns him and his religious beliefs are thrown into a flurry, he questions his very identity. If Paul's anything like me, anything like you, he cries in that Mamertine prison. Maybe he punches a hole through the drywall, curses out the guards, and yells at God in his car when nobody can hear. Maybe he buys a carton of ice cream and eats it straight from the carton while binge-watching Netflix. Okay, maybe Paul doesn't do those last few things, but... Maybe he did get upset. Maybe he did pace back and forth in that Mamertine prison. We, we want to have it all. All of us. We want to amass an RSP. Check. 
maintain a picture perfect marriage check work and jobs that affirm our value to society check hang our hats in comfortable homes at the end of the day check we want health wealth and status and most of all we just want some predictability with life don't we now don't hear me wrong i'm not saying that any of these things are bad things i'm just saying that like Paul, and basically every human being that's ever existed, we want to have it all. We want our lives to be neat and tidy and pre-packaged. But if COVID-19 has taught us anything at all, it's this. Our health, our wealth, success, plans, even social connections teeter. On a precipice and how much emotional and physical energy is exerted just to stay in control of our lives and livelihoods to keep it neat and tidy and then in the end it's not some brute strength force that sends it all spiraling down rather it's this tiny virus invisible to the naked eye it's like every action movie ever when a car steadies and hangs over a cliff and some ever so slight shift in weight sends it tumbling down. We want to be like Paul. We want to have it all. But there will be a day when we don't. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when we lose it all, when that happens, it's a matter of how it's received. In his letter slash email to the Philippians from his jail cell, Paul wants to let his friends in on a little secret. I, says Paul, I, I know the hidden secret of happiness. Now, I imagine that Paul's Philippian friends have vented to him in much the same fashion we would. Paul, we've been kicked out of the synagogues. Our families want nothing to do with us. Many of us are losing our jobs, and it's no fault of our own. Paul, help. Help us, Paul. Paul, why are you so chipper? Why are you so positive all the time? How can we, how can we be happy when, when there's just so much brokenness in and around our lives? And Paul says, Well, Philippians, living hope, I'm so glad you asked. The hidden secret of happiness is this. I, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's not that much of a secret. It's on coffee mugs. It's on posters. It's in social media bios. One of the most quoted verses of all time. But what is Paul saying here? He's saying, my life can tumble over the precipice. I can live rejected in the dampest bachelor pad of all time, jobless, disdained, forgotten, hated, and remain happy because of the power of Christ. We mentioned Paul as the primary example of a man who lost it all until he didn't. But there's another man who had even more than Paul and lost even more. He went even lower. He's a man who truly fell from glory. Rather, he consciously gave up his glory. We know him as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, true God from true God. But in the early church, he was nothing more than a son of a blue-collar family that the larger society spurned and shunned. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. When he was on the cross, donating his blood for our sins and the forgiveness of them, he, he gave it up. Oh sure, Jesus struggled. He tensed before the needle prick. He collapsed to the ground, his body exhausted and full of sorrow. But then he said on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
every muscle in his body aflame with sorrow and pain, somehow relaxed. And his soul did not grasp for his former glory. Instead, he gave it all up for our sake. And he was happy. Jesus is the God who lost it all and still had joy. And when Paul shares his not-so-hidden secret of happiness with the Philippians from his Mamertine prison, he's not unleashing his inner motivational speaker or self-help guru. He's just imitating his God. He wants to tell the Philippians that he is happy Not because life started to go better, he got back on his feet, and the the second half of the country song picked up. Paul is happy because the same power that was in Jesus, enabling Jesus to let go of it all, to untense and welcome the prick, that same power of Jesus is now in Paul. And he's telling the Philippians, it's in you too. And he's telling Ryan, It's in you three. And he's telling living hope, it's in you four. The power of Jesus. Because life is going to suck the blood out of us. We can't keep it neat and tidy. We're going to get poked. We're going to lose it all. But through the power of Christ, we can relax before the poke. We can give it up to God. We can Let go of our tight grip. Paul's not-so-hidden secret of happiness was that his joy was anchored in the unchanging nature of God. You know, often we say, I'll be happy when blank. I'll be happy if blank. You fill in the blank. Maybe Jesus is saying the opposite. Maybe Jesus is saying (laughs) you would only be happy if you let go of blank. In India, they used to catch monkeys by tying coconuts to trees with snacks and fruit inside, and then they put little holes in the coconut. And the holes were just large enough for the monkeys to reach their hand in, and grab the nut or snack inside, but that they were small enough that once they were holding on to the snack, they couldn't get their hands out of the coconut. If only they let go of the snack, then they could pull their hand out and go free. But they didn't. Paul closes out his email to the Philippian church by praising God because Jesus is helping the Philippians let go. He says, you have shared in my troubles. No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. You sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And I have received the full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. This Philippian church faced economic instability, social stigma, and the pains of hunger. Yet through Jesus' power to let go, they scrounged together what they could, and they gave it away. Rather than scrambling for the capital that they were losing, they released the tension and gave of themselves. I don't know about you, but I can be a monkey. I'm not just talking about with money, that, that's definitely one area, but... There are so many other areas in my life where I haven't learned the hidden secret of happiness, of letting go through Jesus' power. Instead, I'm stuck, stuck in a rut with my hand clutching onto the stack. How can I find happiness? So much brokenness in my life. Through Jesus' power of letting go. Friends, my biggest takeaway from Philippians 4, 10 to 20 is that through the power of Jesus at work in me, I can be content even when COVID-19 sends my life spiraling off a cliff. 
I can accept that I am going to bleed and life's going to get messy, but with Jesus at work in me, I have the power to let go. And when I'm feeling least generous with my time, talents, resources, those are the seasons when I most need to let go of whatever it is I'm clutching onto, my will, my ideals, my way. Because friends, we don't need to grasp onto anything when Jesus is clinging onto us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are holding on to us. And we can then let go of the things we are trying to control. God, show us what that blank is in our life. What is the blank that we say we will only be happy when or if? And Jesus, may you fill in the blank. We will be happy because of Jesus, because of the grace of God, because of the love of God. Help us to find the strength in you to bear with all things. Because Lord, you can show us that we have the strength in you we need to keep going in this COVID journey. In Jesus' name, amen.